Well, I do have the top of the hour. Here where I am in Central Time in Springfield, Missouri, it's three o'clock in the afternoon, but I know uh, the folks who are on this webinar are from a number of different time zones and wherever you are, uh, we welcome you to today's webinar on creating outdoor spaces. I think uh, to me, it seems a bit ironic that uh, almost everybody who's on the webinar today is actually indoors at the moment. But the full day version of this particular training does remedy that uh, and spends a lot of time outdoors and, and uh, in hands-on situations that get, will give you an opportunity if you want to delve more deeply into this topic to participate in. And um, at the end of this webinar, I'll give you a little bit more detail about where those full day trainings are going to be held and, and how you can participate in them if you live close enough to one of the sites. My name is Dave Catlin, and I'm gonna be your host for this and future Natural Start Alliance webinars. And um, I thought I'd start out uh, with just a few quick comments about how this works. First of all, as probably most of you would suspect, uh, if you've been on webinars before, all of you who are participants are on mute. Um, we've got uh, nearly 100 people on board right now, and that number is clicking upward. And um, and obviously, if we uh, if we had background noise from those folks, it would be it would be a distraction. So you're all on mute. However, um, you do have the opportunity to communicate with us. Uh, and if you'll if you'll look up in the upper left hand screen, you will see a chat button, and that's how you can reach us. Uh, note. Um, note that you can talk to either everyone or just the panelists. And um, we just have several panelists and all of them are Natural Start Alliance folks. And uh, so feel free to uh, communicate directly with us using that chat box feature. Now at the, at the end of the webinar uh, today, we'll have some questions or some, an opportunity, I should say, for you to ask questions. And if you have one, if you have a question that comes up for you during the course of the presentation, feel free to jot that into the, uh, the uh, text box if you want, the, pen, the um, chat box, and we'll keep track of it and, and that'll be sort of in the hopper of questions that we consider at the end. Uh, we'll also do a specific invitation for your questions at, at the end so you can wait if you prefer to do that. Uh, and we'll get to as many of the questions as, as time permits. Our general aim is to at least have 10 or 15 minutes toward the end for, for questions. Uh, one other thing that's uh, important for you to know is that this session is being recorded and all of you who are on it will receive an email uh, tomorrow is usually when they, they're sent out. You'll receive an email that has a link to that recording. So because you'll be able to access not only the audio but the, the video that you're gonna be seeing here, that means you don't have to worry about scribbling down the words in every bullet point or the or any web address that might show up or references or anything like that. You'll have access to all the information that's on the slides uh, in the recorded version that you'll be able to get uh, starting tomorrow. Okay, well, I think that's all the, the homework stuff. Let me give a little bit of an introduction to our topic and our speaker today. Many of you who are on this webinar grew up, I suspect, in natural environments that um, natural environments that of one sort or another that weren't created, that they were that they just existed already someplace where you had access to them. But especially for institutions like uh, many of you represent, whether they're nature centers or preschools or zoos or botanical gardens. Uh, actually creating spaces, outdoor spaces that are, that are safe and appropriate is becoming more and more important and more and more popular, which is what brings us to today's topic. Our presenter today is an early education director who's affiliated with one of the longest running nature-based preschools in the U.S. Nature's Way Preschool in Kalamazoo, Michigan, is a, a part of the Kalamazoo Nature Center, and it opened back in 1982 when there were few enough 
uh, nature-based preschools in the US, I think you could probably have counted them on the fingers of one hand. She has a Bachelor of Science in Early Childhood Education from Michigan State University, which coincidentally is my alma mater, and a Master of Education from Grand Valley State University, also in Michigan. Uh, but uh, although she's got experience working with Head Start and a local children's museum, she actually arrived at Nature's Way Preschool first as a parent of students there. So she comes to this subject with a variety of perspectives and she'll tell you a little bit more of her story, I'm sure, over the next hour. So let me get out of the way and welcome today's special guest presenter, Heather Parker Getzinger. Heather? I did about something that uh, means a lot to me, both as a mom and an educator. Um, like Dave said, I first came to know about nature preschools because I was lucky enough to land in a community that had a nature preschool. And I really didn't know anything about nature preschools, um, but it just seemed intuitively the right thing to do um, for my own children to get them outside as much as I could. So um, this photo is a, a picture of our school when my own children attended Nature's Way, um, you can see that stone fireplace in the front of our school. Our original school was a little cabin that sat around the fireplace. So we built a new school. Um, this is year four for our new school so that we could double our enrollment. And we now have two classrooms. Um, we kept the fireplace so we could use it as an outdoor fireplace. Um, we have part day sessions and part week sessions. So our students attend either morning or afternoon for two days or three days. So with two classes running simultaneously, we have a student body of 128 students. So um, as I'm uh, spending time with our students, sometimes my mom voice leads me and sometimes my educator voice leads me, but um, usually it's both. Um, and so I'm just going to go over the agenda and let you know kind of what we'll go through today. Um, and before I get started, I also want to say, you know, at Nature's Way, we, we don't believe in having any secrets about what we do or what we know because um, more children playing in nature is more children playing in nature. So if we don't get to your questions at the end, um, please feel free to contact me by phone or by email. I'm happy to share whatever I have learned along the way um, that, that I have observed in um, both regular classroom settings and now in a nature classroom. Um, so today we're going to talk about briefly really what authentic nature play means. Um, we're going to talk about loose parts because I think that's the best way to get started with nature play. And we'll talk about how to create some places to add loose parts. And then um, something that's important to me is creating gathering spaces outside in nature. Um, I, a big part of our program is the discovery and the self-exploration and it's, it's definitely a discovery based program and we believe in giving our students lots of exploration time but it's also really important to develop a sense of community as a class and so i think gathering spaces are tremendously important to a school and then we'll at, we'll finish up with kind of tying in how we um, touch on all the different learning domains while we're teaching outside um, so the first thing that I wanted to talk about is really what the difference is between playing outside and playing in nature. And I've noticed the last few years, um, certainly the nature preschool and um, playing in nature movement has taken off since I've been around as the director in the last five years, and I've noticed that as a parent. Uh, but what I see happening in schools, like on the left, my son attends a school, my fourth grader, uh, my my girls are big girls now in eighth and ninth grade, but this is how they played and continue to play on their playground. It's a traditional playground. And there's a lot of talk in the PTA and in their schools about getting kids outside. Um, and I'm thrilled as a parent that my son is, um, his school is sort of taking on that initiative. They're trying to extend research recess and get kids outside. Um, and I'd certainly rather have him doing that than sitting behind his desk for all of his learning. Um, but that whole get outside movement is quite different than the nature, nature play movement and playing in nature. So the picture on the right is 
um, here at our school and um, that's one of our students playing in an obstacle that we created and I'll show another slide of that as we go along but this is also on our property um, we're lucky to have some woods behind our school that we can hike through and hike to um, and this is where I find the kids really come alive so this is sort of what I consider like real deal nature play. So it is not created by us, by something. We have lots of really cool um, natural playground elements that our students really enjoy and there's tremendous learning benefits there. But what I, what I notice is how different they play when it's nature that is not moved, logs that we did not place in any certain way, they seem to really realize how special it is to play in nature that is real. So um, even though we all have different school landscapes and we can add natural elements to any school, I think that exposing our students to this kind of nature play is hugely important. So I would encourage everybody as we talk about things we can add to any school landscape to find a way to get your students to a place like this where they can play deep into nature. Um, so maybe instead of taking a field trip to a museum or a petting zoo or something like that, taking your students to the woods, deep into the woods where they can really explore and feel like, you know, they're the first students to tread in, in that space. So Dave has uh, the first question here. Um, basically, I just kind of wanted to get a sense of um, what, what your knowledge is or what your experience is with outdoor learning spaces. And then there's a follow-up question to that as well. So I see people have already started to answer that poll, Heather, and I'm gonna give them uh, just a few more seconds to respond and to give us a little bit of a sense of their level of experience in creating outdoor learning environments. So we've got a little more than half of them that have already responded and I'm going to give them just a few more seconds and we'll close the poll and uh, everybody will be able to see the results. Okay, go ahead and complete that if you haven't. Gosh, we've gotten just about everybody. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and I'm going to give you Opportunity to see the results and Heather an opportunity to comment. Okay, so let's see, it looks like we have a little bit of everything here. Some that have um, been doing this for a while, it looks like. Some that um, maybe are just getting started and a lot in the middle. So that's helpful for me. Thank you. And then the next question. Um, I just kind of wondered about if you haven't done it yet, um, what is preventing you from getting started so that I can share some ideas along the way. Okay, so we've just opened that poll and we invite you to tell us uh, by your selection of one of those choices, what's the main thing that prevents your, your site from adding natural playground elements or adding to existing natural elements? Okay, or I'll give you just a few more few more seconds here to read them all and to respond. About another five or six seconds. We're getting I'm getting most everybody here, and I, I suspect there's a few of you who are here who don't currently have a site, and uh, I realize that makes it a difficult question for you to answer, but. Sure. Here we go. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and share those results and now you can all okay. see and respond. Okay. So maybe um, I see there's quite a bit of others. So maybe at the end, if you are one of the folks that said other, that would be an opportunity for you to um, share what it is that um, you're having trouble with. And I can get to some of those questions. Um, so we will talk about a couple ideas for how to access some play items. And then, um, some of the other um, issues too with comfort and things like that and maintenance. Okay. Okay, so uh, for me, I think the easiest place to get started is with some loose parts. 
And if you're not familiar with that term, that was something that an architect named Simon Nicholson, um, a term he developed. Um, and it basically means they're materials that can be moved and carried and redesigned and lined up and put back together again in, in many ways. Um, and they are materials that empower our creativity. They can be man-made or natural. So today we're going to focus on the natural loose parts. But um, you know, those of us who have spent time in as a classroom teacher, we've always had junk boxes and things like that that um, we've seen in inside classrooms. How how much those foster creativity? So we'll talk a little bit about natural loose parts and the benefits that they provide. Um, and I think for me, the the key definition is that they're open-ended. So these are some examples of loose parts that we always have readily available on all of our play spaces. Um, and these are things that you can collect and add to any play space. Um, this right here is one of my favorite places to watch our students play. And it looks like a big giant pile of sticks and branches. And that's exactly what it is, a big pile of sticks and branches. Um, there's really nothing fancy about it, but it's, um, it's large. And it is um, really fun to see the different levels of development on this pile of branches. And one thing I wanted to mention is if you have trouble getting branches like this, we have a relationship with our local power company who knows that we play with sticks and branches. Um, in Michigan, it's Consumers Energy. But uh, wherever you're located, you could reach out to your um, power company or tree trimming service folks like that. If they know why you want their sticks and branches and logs, um, then they're usually really kind about sharing them with you, especially if you explain that children are going to be playing with them and using them. So you just want to make sure they don't um, pass you any thorny kind of pokey um, sticks and branches. But um, this is just a big pile and here here's a side view of it and you can see um, this student here he's able to climb all the way up to the top but last year when he was with us now he's about four and a half um, he he wanted nothing to do with this big pile of sticks because it was a little too intimidating for him so he would hang out down here um, near the bottom and in our philosophy about helping students when when they approach an obstacle like this, you know, if they say, will you, will you lift me up to the top? We really don't because um, basically we feel that when their mind and their body are ready to take on that challenge, they will. And so that's why, you know, there's all kinds of opportunities for whatever level you are. If you're a very young child and, and this looks like too much for you, you can play down and around in here and take the climb when you're ready for it. And the other thing that I love about nature play is that it's forever changing with the weather and the elements. So I took this picture a couple of weeks ago because we'd had a lot of rain and then it got really cold suddenly. And so the leaf litter and debris that was in between the logs got frozen. And so it created basically stair steps to get to the top of the pile. And so students who maybe normally wouldn't climb on this big pile of sticks and branches were able to scamper right up to the top because it was solid. And then we had a little warm up and the snow and ice melted. And so it became sort of unstable again. But the reason this is such a, a cool learning space for students is because, you know, it shifts around a little bit. It's not, it's not the same thing as climbing up and down metal stairs to go up a metal staircase and down a slide. And once you've mastered that on a normal playground, that's sort of it for that task. And so it becomes less fun and it's certainly no longer challenging. But if you're climbing around on something like this, the logs are a little unstable. Your problem solving skills are constantly being challenged because you have to sort of determine if I step here, is it going to hold me? And this one moved around a little bit. So it's just an excellent learning opportunity. And it's as simple as a big giant pile of branches. Um, this one here is a uh, we call it the Nautilus. It's shaped like a Nautilus. And you can see that it starts with kind of some low steps and then it spirals around. 
and um, it does require a little bit of maintenance. So every couple years we have to replace these logs. They um, start to get waterlogged or some of them will get rotten. In fact, you can see kind of that happening here in this one. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting. That's sort of part of the thrill of this log maze is that some of the logs get a little wobbly. And so we balance the line between, is it a thrilling challenge when the log wobbles a little and has it become unsafe? And really that's just a judgment call for us here in Michigan, our licensing bureau, it does have some sort of minimal natural play regulations. It tells us that they can't be higher than 30 inches, but they don't have a way to regulate sort of the strength of the log you're climbing on. So it's just up, up to us to determine when it gets a little too wobbly. But I wanted to show this because um, this is the, this in and, in and of itself is a really cool element for our students to play on. Um, but here's what happens when they have the ability to add loose parts. So this is sort of near our big branch pile. And um, here you can see, you know, two, four, six, about eight students working together here. Um, they were trying to build an eagle nest together. And you can imagine how much time that took for them to drag those really large branches over to the Nautilus and work together and build this. And whenever I look at this picture, I think about how this ever could have happened inside a classroom. Um, and I taught young fives for a couple years and um, I, I was a Head Start director for, for a handful of years. And I've spent lots of time moderating, moderating block play because there seems to be some conflicts there. There's, you know, rarely enough pieces and um, the students kind of get excited about what they're building and there are some behavior issues often that occur in the block area. So I think back to, you know, inside the classroom and the, how I would feel if I saw eight boys head to the block area to try to build something, it would make me uneasy. But when they're working together and building outside, it's like it just takes the roof off any, any of the strain of having to work together. And um, if you have an abundance of loose parts like this, you know, I, I really never hear a student say like, hey, you took my stick because they can just turn around and grab another stick. So um, their, the level of cooperative play, um, their language skills as they work together to create and build something like this, I just um, have never observed that kind of cooperation inside a classroom in the same way when um, students have access to loose parts like this outside. Um, so I wanted to show this because um, this is a really simple way to create a space on any in any outdoor area. Um, this is, we had a volunteer whack this together in a couple hours. It's just a sheet of plywood and um, there's some two by fours along the sides and you can see there's some rope handles there so we can pick it up and move it. This was very inexpensive to make, um, less than $80 I think. And you can see um, some of our big logs and branches and things that the students build with. So we use these log pieces. We have the big stick and branch pile, but I like to have these log pieces or they're, they're basically large branches. And um, I like to have them sliced so that the students can stack with them. And that's why it's nice to have a flat space like that platform. And the platform can also become a stage or any other kind of gathering space that you might need it for. Um, but these boys here, what I wanted to show is that this, the little guy with his hands up and the happy face with the blue jacket on, uh, he is about three and a half and the other boys are four and a half. And so they're all, you, you can see that he's very delighted to be in the action and playing with them, but his developmental level is different than theirs. And so the photo on the right is what Miles was able to build at his age. He, he said, um, look at all my towers and his towers are one, <laughs> one block high, or he got two on the other one. Um, and then the other students built, you know, you know, seven, eight, pieces high and we don't have any students that tall. So I know in order for them to get that up there, they were stretching way over their head. 
and you can see Carmen's tongue out. She's really focusing there. And that's because the logs, you know, different than classroom blocks that are uniform and predictable, and we know exactly what's going to happen when we stack them most of the time. Um, these, she had to twist that log into place a few, you know, a few different tries in order to get it to balance. And so, again, their problem solving skills are, are firing up in a way that our traditional materials for, for children um, don't allow them to continue to work as, as hard or to be as engaged. Um, oh, I did want to mention that it was pajama day that day at Nature's Way. We, we do wear real pants in Kalamazoo most of the time. <laughs> but who doesn't love a pajama day? Uh, and then I also wanted to show um, in this picture mention that we have a wheelbarrow here um, and we have buckets and other things that help the students move around the loose parts if, if they choose to, to the different areas. So at times our loose parts disappear because they've spread all out over our space. Um, so, you know, luckily we can just slice up more with um, when, when they do get all over or sometimes we'll take some time and gather them back up. Some, some I list to learn how to use a chainsaw so that I don't, don't have to ask a volunteer to keep doing that. Um, same loose parts here. It looks like um, they took a couple from the stick pile and a couple from the branch, the, the small logs. Um, but I wanted to show here, this just happened uh, last week with two of our students. They wanted to race around our dirt path. And so they, they decided to make a starting box. And uh, the older student started building the square and the younger student grabbed one of the short log pieces and the older student said to him, uh, if you're going to get those, you need three, you're going to need two more. So he had realized three short ones equals one long one. So um, they're great. They're a great um, starting point for lots of math activities. And here, these are the same parts. Just the other day, the boys were trying to crack the ice. And so they had a big discussion. First, they tried to stomp it with their boots and it wouldn't go through. So they grabbed some of those and they were choosing which ones were gonna smash the ice better. Um, lots of cool language development opportunities when you, when you can provide loose parts like this. Oh, I'm excited to talk about this because in all the all the places that I've ever taught or visited, I've never seen anyone deliberately have a large hole <laughs> in their play space. But um, this is a natural hole that's in the woods behind our school. But now that I have seen how much fun it is, I think we're going to, as soon as the ground thaws here, we're going to dig a big hole closer to our school so that we can play in it more regularly because um, what I noticed watching these two students play in the hole. These are the same two students who often in our classroom like to um, climb in the bean bag or they'll kind of tuck under the loft and find a quiet spot. And pre preschoolers love to hide and they love to feel hidden. And so I think a hole is a really cool thing that can be added to any play space and can be all kinds of different things. And um, they, these students have added their own loose parts to the hole. Nora was making a campfire that day, but we had another class all get into the hole. One of the students said, um, come on, everybody get into the hot tub. And so the whole class fit into the hole. And it just occurred to me that that's something simple that every play space could add. And then sort of the flip side of a hole is a hill. And we, we created this one. So there is some expense to this kind of hill. Um, but now that we know how fun a hole is, if you decided to dig a hole, you could have all that dirt. And um, perhaps that could be the start of your hill. We used a, a large construction tunnel for this hill and built the dirt up around it. And I think hills are really neat learning opportunities for a few reasons. And I'm just going to show a couple of examples of how our students have used loose parts upon the hill. 
So this is actually unintended loose parts. This is our firewood. And we did not really mean for the students to play with it, but we don't care that they do. It was stacked up along the side of the fireplace because we um, have some campfire family nights and things here. And um, one of our students decided it was really important to build it on top of the hill. He was going to make a large wall on top of the hill. And so they worked really hard to lug that firewood over to the top of the hill. And then you can see some of them added rocks and other things. But I wanted to talk about sort of the power, the learning power of a hill with this student here and what happened um, on that day when they were all working together to build that tower. This uh, little boy, Matthew, he had tried to lift one of the logs and he wasn't, he's not as big as the other boys that were hauling the logs. And so he had to roll it <clears throat> all the way from the fireplace way up to the top of the hill. So we got it to the top and it rolled all the way down to the bottom of the hill as soon as he got it up there. And he kind of turned and smiled at me. Not everyone would think that was funny, but he smiled about it and had a good attitude. And so he ran down the hill, pushed it all the way back up to the top of the hill and it rolled right down back the other side. And he smiled again and ran down to the other side. And so the third time, what you see happening on the right is what he ended up doing. He grabbed around it tighter and used his legs and heaved it up to the top because he wanted to be a part of this big communal structure. And so whenever I think about Matthew working that hard to do that, it reminds me, you know, as a teacher, when to stand back and let those moments happen. You know, the power of making a mistake and learning from a mistake, which leads to a life skill of perseverance that is so important. And what I've found as I watch children play inside classrooms and outside classrooms that these kind of natural loose parts just lend the most opportunities for those kind of moments. And when I was talking to Matthew's mom about that story and how hard he worked to bring the log up to the hill, she said to me, you know, I don't think he's ever played on a hill before because um, their family are soybean farmers and their land is very flat. Like most neighborhoods are very flat. Um, certainly students who live in an apartment or in a city, um, there really aren't a lot of hilly spaces where young children actively or regularly go. So I think it's a really neat opportunity for them to have lots of different learning experiences if you can, if you can provide the slope of a hill. Um, so here, um, this is the students as they continued to work on that project that day. They probably some of them spent about a half hour with this activity. And one of the things that I like about this picture is it shows those it shows the logs that are about to tip over there. And the student there with the rock, when he approached that, he said, um, this, this doesn't look stable. I was so impressed by his choice of words. And so he took the logs and flipped them around and sort of rebuilt that one little section there because he realized it wasn't stable. And I think that's because he's had a lot of experience with sort of these wobbly parts and he can size up a log now and tell what's gonna, what's gonna hold and what's not. We consider water a loose part, and I think, um, you know, in Michigan, we do have days where we don't let our students play in the water because it does get below zero here or, um, you know, lots of winter days are near zero. And um, even if the students are dressed appropriately, that's just too cold for them to be wet um, if they got too wet. But most days of the year, we believe in letting them have access to water. So in the corner of our building back there, you can see a rain barrel. And I'll show you another picture of that up, up front. But what I wanted to show here was um, if you're going to let your students play in water, which I think everybody should, it's important to talk to your families about how to dress them to play in water. So you can see in this picture, some of the students are dressed appropriately and can get right into the mud and some of them are not dressed appropriately and that sort of um, inhibits their play some. Some of them will not, some of them will hang back if they're not dressed appropriately. Some of them will just get filthy anyways. Um, but you can see on the right, um, Ava, how she how comfortable she feels in water play when she's literally diving off that bridge to get in that big muddy water because she knows it's okay for her to do that she's got her rain suit on 
So this is a picture of the rain barrel. This is one way that we allow access to water. We have rain barrels on both sides of our building. There's a spigot down below that the students can turn on. So, um, you know, depending on where you live, I learned when I was putting um, this slideshow together that there are some places that might prohibit rain barrel. I'm thinking specifically of Colorado. I think there are some rules about collecting rainwater. Um, so check into that certainly first. But I also learned that um, some communities, the DNR, the Department of Natural Resource website, has uh, some rain barrel initiatives. I, I noticed, I think in Manhattan and Chicago, there are some rain barrel giveaways. Um, so that might be an option. Or, um, you know, a school fundraiser. They're not terribly expensive. But we let our students use the rainwater. Um, it's a nice conservation message. We collect it and sometimes we'll fill the bird bath with it or take it inside and feed, um, fill up the snake or turtles dish with the water that we collected from our rain barrels or we just let them have water play. Um, this is an uh, I think a really fun element to any outdoor play area, even a traditional playground can have a mud kitchen added pretty inexpensively. A volunteer made this for us. I've seen mud kitchens with lots of different designs. This one's pretty simple, um, but this is the same area. This photo on the left was in the fall and then this is the winter. So um, the students really enjoy playing in the ice as much as they do um, the mud and the other loose parts. I, ice becomes a loose part for us in our climate. Um, so I, I did want to talk a, a little bit again about the importance of gathering spaces because, you know, when we let our students explore a lot, but um, we do have things that we want to teach them and share with them. And we also want them to have a sense of community and come together as a class. So I think outdoors, it's really important to have some sort of go-to gathering spaces where you can bring everybody back together. And this is one of our favorites. It's just a log square. We we call it the log square. That's not very creative, but it, it's what it is. And um, I took a photo of the log, just that little piece of log on the left there, just to show you kind of the simple construction of it. It's basically like Lincoln lawns. Um, some, we had a couple of guys um, that work at our nature center come out and get this done in a couple hours. And they just took a chainsaw and cut large notches and kind of u-shaped notches and place the logs down in them and it's incredibly sturdy when they when the just the weight of the log dropping down in the notch so this is rock solid and the students love to climb on it and play in it and they you know it becomes a boat or things that they use their own imagination but it's definitely one of our favorite favorite gathering spaces and then over Shannon's shoulder, our, one of our teachers, you can see we have kind of a traditional log circle as well. Um, and that's this photo here is uh, not our school. This one is at um, Fiddleheads Forest School in Seattle, um, but it's similar to ours. And they are a fully outdoor preschool. So you can see they do their um, gathering time in their calendar and everything right at this log circle. And their design is very similar to ours. They, um, it looks like they dug some shallow trenches and kind of placed the logs in there so that they don't wobble around. Um, we do have logs on our playground that we let the children roll over very intentionally because um, cool things happen underneath logs like slugs and toads and all kinds of um, moss and lichen and different mushrooms growing. So I would suggest some logs on your play space that you can roll around, but um, if you're creating a gathering space, it's nice to secure them. So uh, the reason I have a couple slides about tarps is because I think that is like the step one place to start because it's very, very inexpensive. And um, again, it's just a way to create a gathering space. Here, um, we invited our families to come have lunch one day. And not everybody's comfortable sitting on the ground. So it's a great way to get everybody started to sort of easing into being more comfortable playing in nature. Um, and then it's also a sort of a way to define a space. We keep a, a tarp folded up in our mudroom so that if we're taking a hike into the woods, we can just create our own gathering space, maybe in a new spot or wherever we want to be. And again, if we're letting our students explore, it's a place to call them back to. So it helps us with some group management to have sort of 
um, a designated spot and a tarp is a really, really inexpensive way to do that. The other photo on this slide is um, Miles with this marble runner. If you um, are trying to do more out, outside time and outdoor play time, um, Miles sometimes has a hard time saying goodbye to his caregiver at drop off. And so his favorite toy is the marble runner. So we just sometimes grab that, fold up the tarp because we don't want our marble runner to get muddy. It's, a, uh, you know, on a wet day like this. So it's also a way to get something off the ground that maybe you want the students to be able to enjoy outside. And then the other thing that you can do with tarps outside is create some sort of magical places. Um, one of our teachers, Holly, when we were studying nocturnal animals, she made this bat cave just by um, strapping some tarps to trees with, you know, zip ties and ropes. And um, this could really be anything, anything your students are interested in or whatever you're studying. It could be an ocean or um, any kind of sort of magical creation and we did everything in the bat cave that day we ate snack in the bat cave we did all our lessons in the bat cave and they were coming in and out of it all day so um, it's a great it's a great and inexpensive way to kind of transform an area um, so the next poll question dave do you have that ready i will have it for you here in just a second okay okay so this poll question asks you, for which, for which learning domain do you feel least confident facilitating learning activities in nature? So again, for which learning domain do you feel least confident when you're facilitating activities outdoors? Give you just a, a few seconds to think about it. We've got a lot of responses coming in here. And about another oh, uh, 10 seconds or so here. Okay, well, thanks everybody. And I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll and share the results with all of you. Okay. Alrighty. Well, um, I'm not surprised to see gross motor because when I was listing example as being a low result, and I'm glad to see that because it, that one seems sort of obvious, right? We can all find ways to move their whole body outside. So um, I, do, I do have a few examples of um, each of the other domains. So we'll go through those now. And, and the reason I asked that question, too, is because I think that um, sometimes as early childhood educators, we are often asked to sort of defend the power of play. And um, I think sometimes in nature play, that happens even more. So sometimes, whoever it may be, parents visiting your school or administrators or people who are maybe unfamiliar with um, the power of nature play, they might kind of ask you to explain, well, does, are, is there real learning taking place and does this really work? So my first suggestion would be to take photos because um, that's a visible way to share with families and folks who are interested in what you're doing, um, how, how it works. Um, but these are some examples, just, just maybe one of each domain that we can talk about. So this is a, a fine motor activity. We put up that same platform and those same log pieces. We just put a bucket of chalk out and let the students color on them. And it's really fun to see how they incorporate that into their large motor play too. Sometimes they'll put X's on top that mean something to them and they'll place them around and do an obstacle course or something. But um, I remember this day in the fall when I was sitting and coloring with Sierra and just thinking how much more important that time was for her to be coloring there on that day outside um, than it would be if she was sitting at a table with a with a pencil and a paper because the birds were chirping. In fact, a flock of geese flew over our head and it was a little bit windy and we were talking about the colors and how they looked on the logs. And when children are playing in nature, all of their senses are engaged. And that just doesn't happen the same way inside. So I think 
we can create similar experiences to the classroom, but I think the benefits are much greater just because, um, for one, the sheer enjoyment of nature, but also the way that it lights up all of your senses. Um, so that's a nice fine, fine motor activity. And then I just put a couple of gross motor ones, but since everybody seems to make that connection quickly, I'll just, um, this is just a, a piece of log that has a nice curve to it. So we use it for balancing. And then on the right here, um, digging and shovels are excellent large motor activities. And um, what was happening here, and the reason I took a picture, is because um, this student here, you can see he's got kind of a weird grip on the shovel. And he was trying to dig, but he was just kind of jabbing it up and down. And so this older student, Remy, was telling him, he's got his boot up in the air and he's explaining to him, no, you have to step on the top. And so he had already figured out how to, you know, use his legs as he's digging. But shoveling is kind of a whole body workout. Your arms and your legs need to be working together. So we have a, a pile of rocks, but also a, a sand pit is a nice way to um, allow for shoveling. Um, so the social emotional benefits of nature play are really just limitless. Um, the way that I see students working together, playing in nature is just um, not something that I ever observed in all my years in a regular classroom. And, and this photo shows an example of students that wanted to carry this giant log across the playground. And it took them about 20 minutes to do it because it was heavy and they all had to work together to do it. And it's funny, they got it all the way where they were moving it to and then they didn't even do anything with it over there because the joy was in the journey um, that they took together to get it there so um, this is just one more example of students working together and this is in the woods behind our school this is um, basically like a natural teeter-totter and somehow this log is really bouncy and you can see because jean Tisa's foot is way off the ground here. And so in, in order for it to work though, somebody has to pump it up and down. So there's a lot of discussion about who gets to be the pumper and who gets to be the rider. And um, so the sort of the conversation skills and the language skills and the teamwork and the turn taking and all of that um, can really come out when, when students are able to find opportunities to play like this. Um, so these are a couple cognitive examples, um, and this is why I would suggest taking photos a lot, because even folks who think it's important for children to play and learn in nature, they still might want to see, well, how do you really teach colors? How do you really teach math, you know, when you're outdoors? So um, this is the same, this is sort of gathering place and loose parts coming together here. This is our deck down at our creek. Um, it's a very simple platform deck. Um, on the left, it's in the fall, and on the right, it's in the winter. And um, we, we do a lot of sort of gather up and then come together things. So the students here had to gather leaves and then place them on the, on the paper that matched their, their color. So some are starting to read and could match the letter sound B for brown and uh, some of them were just matching colors but then we do some counting and things um, on the right Shannon had, had hidden some colored ice cubes along the trail and the students were so thrilled to find those treasures they kept calling them and then we gathered at the deck and they put all their treasures together and we sorted them by color and did some math and counting things with them but um, you know, what, what this reminds me when I see uh, all of those students listening and so engaged in this activity, it's because they were a part of it with their body as they moved and hiked along the trail. It's, it's such a different experience for them than if Shannon had just pulled out of her own bag, um, counting and sorting activities herself. But when you can get them outside and moving and being part of the lesson themselves, you can see how, how engaged they were. Um, this is a really easy way to cr create a little language center in your outdoor space. Um, some communities you may have seen, our, our town, Kalamazoo, has quite a few of these around. They're called little free libraries. And so if you have a book, you leave them. If you need a book, you take one. And they are literally little, little free libraries. So this is kind of um, more towards the parking lot of our school. And I see a lot of parents 
um, pulling books off the floor of their car and bringing them into the little free library and then they'll dig one out or if their student want, doesn't want to leave for the day, they can go to the, to the library and grab a book and sometimes that gets them in the car. But it's really nice. It's nice to have a reading space outside. Um, you can see how much the girls are enjoying just reading together um, while they play outside. So just to kind of wrap up before we get to the questions, um, an easy way to get started is with loose parts. Sticks and branches are super easy to add to any play space. And it's, it's really fun to see how, how much the students enjoy playing with those. As simple as it is, it, it really um, such a learning opportunity for them. And then I think developing some gathering places. Um, if you are a classroom teacher, I think I think uh, the group management part of you will enjoy being able to have a place to call your students back to as much as we need to give them places to explore. We always need to keep them safe. And so gathering back together is important when we're having a lot of outdoor exploration time. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is to just trust yourself. You don't have to know a lot about nature. You may not even be 100% comfortable spending time in nature, but you will be good at this because very quickly you'll see how much better you feel when you spend out time outside in nature. And um, myself and all of my staff, we have all taught in regular schools and now um, we can't imagine going back to where we don't spend this time outside just for our own mental health and um, in our own sense of peace and, and our own pleasure. So as an educator, um, this is a gift you can give yourself as well. You, you will definitely see how much your students come alive, but um, you need this time too, and they need your strength and your health. Um, so this is something that's good for all of us. And then um, certainly important to model comfort and enthusiasm. You know, all of our body language is so transparent to our young people. So the more time you spend in nature, the more comfortable you'll be in nature, and so will your students. And then finally, that the learning opportunities are endless. So um, you know, I think I was trying to show with some of those slides where, we, where I showed examples of the different domains really any objective you have that you wanted to teach inside your classroom, um, you can find a way to teach it outside and I think it will be more meaningful to your students. So the last slide before we take any questions, um, this is kind of back, back with the idea where we started, which was, um, you know, sort of very, very authentic nature play. And, this isn't something we can create. You know, we don't have anything right around our school that looks or feels like this because nobody put those logs there. Those trees fell over because they were old and that's where they landed. So um, we call this the rainbow tree because it's shaped like a large rainbow. Um, but finding a way to get your students to play like this once in a while, I think is, is a gift to any student and a gift to any school. Are there any questions? Okay, well, uh, what I'm going to uh, invite everybody to do, and, and uh, those of you who joined late may uh, not have heard me say this in the beginning, but that chat function in the upper left-hand part of your screen is your way to type in a question. And there's plenty of you that have been using that chat function already, and including to ask some questions. So while some folks are um, perhaps uh, typing in some new questions, Heather, I'm going to go ahead and ask you one or two uh, sure. that have already come in. One of the, the there's several questions, uh, and many of them posed by Wilma, who has some safety related concerns. Sure. And, and I'll, I'll pass along a couple of those questions. One, one of her questions is, how do you, when we're talking about loose parts that are sticks, how do you deal with, with and I'm putting in quotes, swords, sticks that become oh. swords? Weapons, yeah. Well, um, you know, I guess it would be sort of the same way you handle behavior management inside a classroom with like a long block or something like that. So there definitely has to be rules to any any school and any materials. Um, our own school rule, we do not allow any kind of weapon play. So um, we just, we don't have it. So we, we remind them if something becomes a sword, we just say we don't we don't use the sticks as swords and suggest other things that they can 
they can be used for. Um, it's, it's interesting how quickly students um, can create something that's not quite a weapon, but um, really, <laughs> really seems like a weapon, like a, a well, it's not a sword, it's a magic wand or something like that if they really want to wave it around. Um, but we just sort of redirect them with some appropriate uses of, of the sticks to build with or um, we do allow magic wands, but sometimes I think that's a, a knee jerk reaction to somebody who really wanted it to be a sword <laughs> and, is, and is clever. Well, so and related to those kinds of safety issues, we have um, several questions, one from Wilma, one from Ellen, and there may be some others that I haven't gotten to yet here that are in general um, about liability. Do you have a special permission form um, for that you know, where you tell parents that you're going to be taking their kids into the woods behind the school? Do you, uh, do you have some kind of a waiver? No, we don't. That's a good question. You know, um, what we really try to convey when we have an open house or when we're talking to families before they enroll, we're very transparent about what we do. Um, and the message that we mainly try to share is that we, this is how we are meant to play. This is really how young children are supposed to play. It's just sort of been our culture in the last, you know, many years to, to sort of over-regulate or get away from sort of this free kind of play, but this is really, this is how we're supposed to play. So it's definitely a parent education piece, um, but we, we show them our spaces and some parents are sort of uncomfortable with it at first, um, but certainly our number one goal is always the safety of our of our students. So we have some rules about how high they can climb um, in this picture, for example, you can see Shannon's hand right here. We don't let our students climb higher than we can reach them. So that's kind of one rule or one, one way that we um, provide some safety and some reassurance for families. Um, I'm, I should be standing right here, but I ran back to take this photo. So <laughs> then I ran back to the other side of the lot because the students can, you know, they're physically able to climb up to here and then we couldn't reach them. So we do have some school guidelines about safety and, and that's one of them. We don't let our students climb higher than we can reach. Um, but we don't, you know, we don't need a special waiver or anything um, that in the state of Michigan, the natural play spaces are regulated. I think I mentioned 30 inches is the highest. If you're going to create a natural play space, you cannot go higher than 30 inches, but um, they don't, they don't regulate, you know, where we hike to or into the woods because we didn't create that space. It's not part of our playground. So really the risk is no different than if you were, um, you know, in a city daycare or something and your students were taking a walk to a park, you know, we take a walk to these woods, but um, we don't need any kind of special, you know, permission to do that. It's just part of our program and we just make sure that our families are aware of what we're doing and um, they certainly come along very quickly when they see how happy and engaged their students are when they're allowed to play like this. So there's several, uh, there are several other questions related to safety issues, and I'm going to pass along one or two. Okay. Although I think um, there's been such an interest in that. My expectation is that in all likelihood in the future, we'll have a, a session that's specifically on risk management. But um, one I think that's a good idea. There, there are some questions, though, about how you manage uh, hazards or potential hazards, and specifically mentioned are snakes and poison ivy. Do you do any management on the property ahead of time with those things in mind? Um, well, Michigan only has one venomous snake and they're very, very rare. Uh, and I don't think our habitat in our woods is very ideal for, it's called the Massasauga. And um, I've only actually ever seen one snake on our property and it, and it was a milk snake, which wouldn't hurt anybody. Um, but as far as poison ivy, you know, we know what it looks like. And so we'll just point it out to our students as we're hiking. Um, there's some poison ivy on that tree. So stay, you know, stay right behind Mrs. G or stay right behind Miss McLeese. There's some poison. We know it, where it is and, and we look for it. It's not on our natural playground that we've sort of developed and created, so, you know, the 
the slides with the log obstacles and things like that. But definitely as we hike, we encounter it and we just watch for it and walk around. Um, and that's sort of, you know, that's kind of a lesson to the students and to whoever's on our hike with us that day, parents or volunteers. You know, there are some things in nature that aren't 100% awesome all the time. You might, you might get stung by a bee once in a while or there is things like poison ivy, but um, certainly the benefits outweigh those little nature annoyances a thousand times over. Okay. Um, several, there are several questions about sort of uh, what your layout is and basically want to know, are, you know, do you own the woods? The quick answer is yes, you do. Yes. Uh, and and um, that the, the, the natural play area that you've developed actually adjoins your woods. So there's, you know, there's immediate proximity of the two. Yes, yes. If um, yes, I can clarify that. So our school has always um, had nine acres, but and we hiked in that wooded area behind our school. Um, but we did, in terms of just sort of free play, we've had a natural playground right around the school, and that's where like the platform and the sand pit and the rocks and sort of the deliberate pieces of of our natural playground exist. Um, but we did have a a neighbor to our property gift us another 20 acres. Um, and that just happened last year. So that opened up a whole new a whole new area of hiking space for us. So now we have 30 acres behind our school. So it's it's quite a it's quite a hike for some some of our students. We don't do it all the time. For example, this rainbow tree is kind of a once a week thing and it has to replace some of their free play time because it takes a while to hike to it. So I've got time for one last question, even though there are more questions than this uh, awaiting, and, and uh, we sure appreciate everybody's answering them. And, and uh, Heather, is any, any opportunity that you might have to answer these folks, say, via email? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you can email me. And then um, my phone number is also on the, the Kalamazoo Nature Center website. If you click on the preschool link, that's our phone number, my email, and I'm happy to follow up with any questions or chat with you on the phone if you have any questions about anything in, in this PowerPoint, but also, you know, any questions about nature play or creating spaces. Okay. Um, so, well, let me go ahead then, and uh, I've asked you to have the, the control of your screen there. Oh, you okay. Go ahead and click Oh, it. I'm sorry, Dave. Yeah. That's okay. Gotcha. Um, okay. There's just a, a, a couple of things that I want to say as a sort of a wrap up to this uh, webinar. And one of those things is that there is one webinar remaining in this series. It's going to be next week, next Wednesday on February 22nd at this same time, depending on the time zone that you're, that you're in. Uh, and it is on the topic of documenting and assessing learning in the outdoors. And uh, we hope you'll join us. And now I, I know a number of you probably are already signed up for that one. Uh, and we'll look forward to, uh, to seeing you at that time. We also have, and this is important, I think, at least for those of you who are uh, accessible to um, Fiddleheads Forest School in Seattle, which was one of the locations that Heather mentioned in her presentation, uh, Nature's Way Preschool in Kalamazoo, Michigan, which is where Heather is based, and the Nature Preschool at Irvine Nature Center, uh, just outside of Baltimore. Those are um, official training sites of the Natural Start Alliance. And so at those sites, uh, coming up between now and June, we're going to be holding full day uh, hands-on workshops on all of these topics and with these same presenters that you're hearing on these webinars. So we encourage you to consider, if you're at all uh, within traveling distance of those locations, uh, consider that uh, the opportunity to join us. And um, because you've participated in a webinar, um, there is a special rate available to you to attend. The ordinary rate is, a, is a $129 or a package of all three web, uh, all three live trainings for $329, but you can get 15% off of those figures uh, if, you, if you cite this code. And I'm sure this is actually webinar number two. Uh, the, the code is, that you should use is webinar number two. 
and we'll I'll make sure we change that before we, uh, or at least make we'll make a note when we send this out. So webinar number two, that co code is good, and actually that code is good through next week, so it's good for a week from today. So through February twentieth, I think actually through February twenty first. Um, so again, the the code would be webinar two, good for the next week. And if you want information about this stuff in general, uh, all of the all those links and registration forms and all that kind of stuff can be accessed online through the naturalstart.org website. That's forward slash training. And I'll go ahead and leave that up for a little bit. Um, we really, once again, appreciate the active involvement that you've all had. Heather, I think you'll enjoy reading the the chat discussions because there was a lot of um, a lot of back and forth actually answering some of some of the questions that were posed by people uh, from the experience of the uh, the webinar participants. So, oh, nice! Yeah, it'll be a it'll be a nice read for you, and you'll be able to get that. Great. And once again, and once again a reminder to everyone on the on this webinar that we have recorded it, and that recording will be available to you online. You'll get a link to that webinar, uh, that recorded webinar, uh, to probably tomorrow, which usually takes about a day to transfer this over, a link so that you can go back and access all this information, access the websites and the bullet points and that kind of thing. Finally, there's one other thing that, uh, that we would like to invite you to do, and uh, that is um, respond to a, a brief survey, a brief, brief uh, request for your feedback. And um, uh, our Kristen Kunkel of the, of the Natural Start Alliance has just posted a link to that survey on the uh, chat room. And so we encourage you to uh, go ahead and, and give us your feedback right now. It'll just take you a minute or two. And uh, that, that uh, link will also be repeated in the um, in the email that you get tomorrow that has the link to the recorded version. So once again, thank you to everybody. Thank you, especially to you, Heather. And thank you, everybody. Thanks for being here. We look forward to uh, contact with some of you next week, and I hope some of you in person at the official training sites around the country. Goodbye. Happy, everybody. happy Valentine's Day. The same to you. <laughs>